Hello, and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today, I want to talk about a case that's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse. This is a civil law case. However, it's one that has tremendous potential impact on the firearm community. So I want to talk about it a little bit here. I got a lot of questions back when it uh, when this decision came out, which was back in February, but there's been a lot of stuff going on. So this is the case of Price and Smith and Wesson. What's happening in this case is that Smith and Wesson is being sued and it's claimed that they're at fault uh, with respect to a shooting because their guns don't include smart gun technology. So essentially the argument is that Smith and Wesson should be selling every gun they sell in Canada with this smart gun technology. So let's have a look at this case. Now there's a couple of things here. First, this is not the ending of the case. This case isn't done. This is an application uh, that is happening in the course of this case. So this is just one step in the whole process. The second thing is that I'm going to be trying a bit of an experiment here. I'm going to be doing a quicker summary video, and then I'll come back to this case later and do a more in-depth deep dive into what's going on. So this will be the short, uh, the short version if you don't have the attention span. Later on, I'll go through in more detail if you want to really understand what's happening in this case. So this is, as I said, potentially a really big deal because if at the end of the day, Smith & Wesson is found to be liable on this basis, then I think a lot of gun manufacturers aren't going to want to have anything to do with Canada. And so we'll see the available pool of firearms shrink. And to the extent that anyone will, they'll want to make sure that it's got this smart gun technology on it. And I'll have some comments on the current state of the art there. And in fact, the the possibilities for how good it could get, because uh, e the state of the art right now is not very good. And there's certain things that just limit how good it could ever be. So essentially what happened here, and I'm not going to go into too much of the details, but uh, there was a shooting. A couple of people were killed and many people were injured. And this uh, shooting was, the firearm used was a Smith & Wesson M&P 40, uh, which was stolen from the per person who purchased it. So the guy who, uh, the guy who did the shooting uh, didn't acquire it legally. He stole it or somebody else stole it and sold it to him. Somehow it ended up in his hands. Now you might be wondering, why are they suing Smith & Wesson? Why aren't they suing the guy who actually, you know, did the shooting well uh the guy who did the shooting is dead uh he killed himself in the process and i somehow doubt that he is a person of means i doubt that he's got a lot of money his estate probably isn't a, a millions of dollars kind of thing it's probably a tens or hundreds of dollars kind of estate as a general principle if you're looking to sue somebody you want to sue somebody who has money the the sort of adage is you can't get blood from a stone. If you sue somebody and get, you know, a million dollar judgment, but they're homeless and have no assets, you're never going to see that money. You can only actually get money from somebody who has money to pay you. So the guy who actually committed the shooting, no money. Smith & Wesson, many monies. Smith & Wesson is the much more attractive target. Now, so that's sort of why Smith & Wesson, why they want to bring Smith & Wesson in on this one. They don't want to, they don't want at the end of the day to just be without somebody to go after. That tends to be a, a factor that also can weigh a bit on judges because where you have sympathetic plaintiffs, they're going to want to find a way to, uh, to find for them. So that's uh, something... Uh, judges are human too. They have emotions. So that's something to think about as we go through here. Now, what's happening? The plaintiffs advanced three separate uh, claims, three separate grounds on which they say Smith & Wesson might end up owing money. And this is part of a civil uh, civil claim. You have to sort of say why you think the other side owes you. And they, they have to fall into some sort of legal... Uh, established concept or one that you can argue should be a newly established one which is tough so they argue three things uh the first is strict liability which is this principle of if you uh, for instance build a reservoir on your land and somehow that reservoir breaks free 
that you would be strictly liable. Now, this is usually a land sort of thing, and case law has fairly limited uh, the availability of strict liability in Canada. So that was one argument that they make. The other is public nuisance, and that's when you do something that interferes with the public generally. So examples would be if you are burning on your land and the smoke ends up blotting out the city so that nobody can see what's going on in, say, the town of Vancouver. And, you know, that would be a potential public nuisance because it's affecting a, a whole wide range of people. The third claim is negligent design or manufacture. They're saying that because they designed this particular item in a way that uh, doesn't include safety features, that being the smart gun technology, that it's a negligence of the design and therefore they can be liable. So as an example of this, uh, consider a car manufacturer who makes a vehicle who, and that vehicle has faulty brakes. Somebody is driving that vehicle and they see a pedestrian, they slam on the brakes and the brakes don't work because the design was bad. That pedestrian gets run over. Now that pedestrian doesn't own the car. They've got no contract or no sort of established relationship with the car manufacturer, but they could still potentially sue on the basis that those bad brakes caused them to be injured. And there's a, a path to liability there. So that's kind of an example of that, uh, that argument. Now, what is happening at this stage is that Smith & Wesson is bringing a motion to strike out these claims. So they're saying essentially that these claims are no good, that they are too weak to be even entertained as far as going to a trial, and that therefore, uh, essentially, the court should throw them out and Smith & Wesson just wins. And this would be a great thing for Smith & Wesson because, of course, everybody likes to win their court case. But also, if they can get it struck out at this stage, it protects them from certain things that they don't want to have happen. One of those being discovery. Uh, no company wants to be subject to discovery if they can avoid it. Because what discovery is, is you exchange documents. And it means that the other side has the ability to look through a bunch of your papers. That's expensive in the sense that, you know, it takes some time and money and so forth to get all of this stuff together. And you never really want people digging through your business. So that's uh, something they would like to avoid. Now, the court then has to evaluate all three of these claims, and they have to evaluate them on the standards for the motion to strike uh, procedure, which the motion to strike procedure actually applies fairly generous standards. The reason why that is, is because these are uh, standards for dismissing something without a claim or without a trial rather, which means that uh, you don't want to do that lightly. You don't want to throw out somebody's case if they have a decent argument. So they note that uh, this is a very high test. The first thing is that you basically assume that the factual elements uh, as pled by the, the plaintiffs are true. And the reason why is that you're looking at this on the plaintiff's best case. You're saying, you know, if their case is made out exactly as they say it would, could they win at trial? So because they don't get the opportunity to prove those uh, things or to have them cross-examined, at this stage, we just assume that they're true, unless there's something that's like patently ridiculous. You know, if you said, uh, so-and-so is liable because they let werewolves drive their cars, we might toss that particular factual claim as being completely, you know, completely out there. But in general, the facts are assumed to be true. So that's not the case at a trial where you have to prove your facts. The other thing is that it has to be sort of plain and obvious that there is, uh, plain and obvious that it's impossible for someone to succeed on a particular claim before they're going to throw it out. Uh, they note the pleading is read generously and it will be unsatisfactory only if it is plain, obvious, and beyond a reasonable doubt that the plaintiff cannot succeed. And that's at paragraph 50 here. They note bare allegations and conclusory legal statements based on assumption or speculation are not material facts. 
They are incapable of proof, and therefore they are not assumed to be true for the purposes of a motion to determine whether a legally viable uh, cause of action has been uh, pleaded. But you do assume sort of properly pled facts. The court goes through some uh, some effort here in noting that uh, things are not to be dismissed lightly. I'm going to quote that portion because it really helps explain what's happening in this case. So matters of law that are not fully settled should not be disposed of on a motion to strike an action for not disclosing a reasonable cause of action, and the court's power to strike a claim is exercised only in the clearest cases. The law must be allowed to evolve, and the novelty of a claim will not militate against a plaintiff. However, a novel claim must have some elements of a cause of action recognized in law and be a reasonably logical and arguable extension of established law. In Knight and Imperial Tobacco Limited, the Supreme Court of Canada noted that although the tool of a motion to strike for failure to disclose a reasonable cause of action must be used with considerable care, it is a valuable tool because it promotes judicial efficiency by removing claims that have no reasonable prospect of success, and it promotes correct results by allowing judges to focus their attention on claims with a reasonable cause of success. Chief Justice McLaughlin stated, Valuable as it is, the motion to strike is a tool that must be used with care. The law is not static and unchanging. Actions that yesterday were deemed hopeless may tomorrow succeed. Before Donahue and Stevenson, which is a case that maybe I should cover at some point, it's a, a big torts case, and I'm not normally a torts guy, but this is one of the famous cases. But uh, before Donahue and Stevenson introduced a general duty of care to one's neighbor premised on foreseeability, few would have predicted that, absent a contractual relationship, a bottling company could be held liable for physical injury and emotional trauma resulting from a snail in a bottle of ginger beer. Before Headley Byrne and Heller and Partners, a tort action for negligent misstatement would have been regarded as incapable of success. The history of our law reveals that often new developments in the law first surface on motions to strike or similar preliminary motions like the one at issue in Donahue and Stevenson. Therefore, on a motion to strike, it is not determinative that the law has not yet recognized the particular claim. The court must ask whether, assuming the facts pleaded are true, there is a reasonable prospect that the claim will succeed. The approach must be generous and err on the side of permitting a novel but arguable claim to proceed to trial. In Atlantic Lottery Corp. and Babstock, the Supreme Court stated that the test applicable on a motion to strike is a high standard that calls on courts to read the claim as generously as possible because cases should, if possible, be disposed of on their merits based on the concrete evidence presented before judges at trial. So what does all that mean? Well, it means that a claim surviving a motion to strike is not exceptional. It's fairly normal. And that essentially this doesn't say that this is an argument, you know, if something survives the motion to strike, it doesn't say it's an argument that's necessarily going to win. It just says it's an argument that is not impossible. It's not crazy. Now, this is very similar to the procedure that's being undertaken by the registrar in the uh, current cases ongoing with respect to the uh, Section 74 issues. They want those pleadings struck as well. So you can see some parallel there. That's kind of the, the battle that's ongoing. Now, they, they make three claims. Uh, the first claim is this strict liability claim. The court allows the motion to strike that one. So what that means is that that claim is struck out and it's gone. The court points out that this is typically something that's used for uh, for land or real estate. And they describe it as a land or real property tort that is not applicable to products liability claims. So they don't want to extend this particular case to the application of uh selling a product which might be defective or misdesigned or that sort of thing. So they say, under Canadian law, product liability is a matter of negligence, not strict liability. I think this is a, an excellent point from the court because if they had allowed this, it would have potentially opened the door for lawsuits to all sorts of companies, not just gun companies, but lots of other companies could have potentially been on the hook for that. They say, since there's, since there's nothing about the plaintiff's claim that has anything to do with Smith and Wesson's land, and there's nothing that is escaping, it is plain and obvious that Rylands and Fletcher, which is the case on strict liability, has nothing to do with the case at bar. 
Under Canadian products liability law, a manufacturer is liable under the law of negligence described above. Thus, it is plain and obvious that the claim for strict liability is doomed to failure, and this claim should be struck from the plaintiff's statement of claim. So there were three claims made, one down, two to go. So the next one is the public nuisance claim. And so as sort of mentioned, public nuisance is things like if you're, they give some examples in this, and maybe I'll read those out. Uh, so they say the classic examples of public nuisance in this category include obstructing a public highway with a stalled motor vehicle, uh, barriers, protest marches, excavations, or heavy smoke, blocking access to a public park, blocking a navigable waterway, destroying a provincial forest, polluting a river or stream, polluting the air with smoke and fumes, obstructing a public sidewalk with temporary structures, demonstrators, or lineups of people selling food that is unfit for human consumption, and running a body house. These are all instances of either an interference with public rights of way or an interference with public rights in property, safety, health, or comfort. And they say the second category of public nuisance arises from widespread interference with the use and enjoyment of private land. In this situation, a public nuisance arises where the defendant's activities have created a multiplicity of private nuisances that may be remedied either by each landowner as a private nuisance or cumulatively by public remedies as a public nuisance. So essentially, if you interfere with the use of a hundred people's things, uh, that might create a claim as a public nuisance as opposed to just a private nuisance. The court here points out that this doesn't really apply, that they could come after the guy who actually had the gun in his hand and pursue him for creating a public nuisance, but that it's too far removed to go after Smith and Wesson on that basis. So the claim, or the court also strikes out this claim. So we started with three, we knocked out uh, the strict liability, we're now knocking out public nuisance, one left to go, and that's the negligence claim. On this one, the court says that it's not ridiculous that it could proceed. Essentially, they're saying that the argument could be made that Smith and Wesson could be negligent on this uh, point, and so the court declines to knock this one out. That doesn't mean that it's going to succeed. They just say it's an arguable issue. They point out that Smith and Wesson makes various uh, at, you know, arguments about how whether it would be appropriate or inappropriate for them to include these features in their design. But they say those are arguments for trial, not at the motion to strike. So the court declines to strike this out at this particular point and is allowing it to go to trial, which means that uh, they're going to get discovery. Now, let's have a little bit of discussion here about the, the fundamental issue, because really what they're asking, what they're, uh, the plaintiffs are suggesting is that all firearms in Canada need to be sold with these smart gun technologies. Now, I don't want a gun with smart gun technologies. There's a number of reasons why. First, I think that keeping my firearms in a safe and trigger locked is a is a suitable and sufficient uh, protection. Uh, it's probably excessive considering the circumstances in which I live, which is me and my wife live alone. Uh, we don't have any kids. So, you know, if I was worried about kids getting to it, I might be a little more concerned. But these things have all sorts of negative uh, effects. One, uh, one sort of company that was trying to pioneer these smart gun technologies was boasting about how they were getting an 80% uh, success rate in identifying an authorized user. I can tell you that if I had a, a, a handgun or in fact any firearm that functioned 80% of the time I pulled the trigger, that handgun would be, or that firearm would be going in the garbage. It would be getting destroyed, it would be getting disposed of. Um, I might put it up for sale, but I'd be noting, you know, this gun doesn't work, don't buy it to use, buy it only if you just want to scavenge this thing for parts because 80 percent reliable is 100 percent garbage it will lose you any you know any target shooting competition you participate in uh, an 80 percent reliable gun will cause you to lose and nobody wants to go hunting with an 80 percent reliable gun if you've got everything sighted in on your deer or elk or moose or whatever it is you're hiding or you're hunting and you pull the trigger you want it to fire. You don't want the animal to wander off just because your gun isn't working. 
So that is an unacceptably low level of success for any sort of firearm. Uh, in Canada, we don't really have the same sort of self-defense provisions, but when we think about this in terms of a defensive use of a firearm, do you really want a, you know, a 20% chance that the gun doesn't work if you are firing this to preserve your life? There is no, none of the purposes for which you would have a firearm uh, permit or a 20% failure rate where you'd still want to have this gun. So that is one problem. Another problem is that I sometimes want to lend my firearms out. I often want to bring new people to the range. That's a fun thing for me. It's a fun thing for them. So it, I can't do that if I'm sitting there and I have to go and, you know, rejig my, my gun each time or if it's impossible for me to do so. So that's, again, a, a serious negative. Some of these things rely on... Uh, you know, fingerprint or palm print or that sort of thing, or maybe a grip, all of which would be interfered with if you're wearing gloves. Now, why would you want to wear gloves? Oh, right. I live in Canada where it gets real cold, like not a little cold. It gets real cold. And in some parts of Canada, it gets real, real cold. You go up north and you will experience new and painful levels of cold. So you wear gloves, because of course you do, because it's cold. A gun that doesn't work when you're wearing gloves is a gun that doesn't work for many of the scenarios in which Canadians want to use them. Um, the other problem that these things have is that they're often very easily bypassed. People have done research on this and they find that they can be bypassed with things like a magnet held to the side, uh, very similar things. But the other thing is if you have the gun, it's physically in your possession and you have it for an extended period, there's nothing that stops you from disassembling this firearm and bypassing all of the smart gun technology. You take the lock and you just bridge those wires and say, okay, now it's just automatically going to generate the signal that says this is an authorized user. You may, you know, there may be ways of you have to remove parts and swap in other parts. But you can't stop somebody from doing that if they have the gun in their possession. Barring some somebody who actually physically owns the product from, you know, bar, trying to defend something from the authorized owner and user of the product is going to be very difficult to do. Uh, this is something that is doomed to failure. So... The whole idea of this as being something that will prevent uh, thieves from ever being able to fire it, to my mind, is it's a it's a fool's errand. There is no way that that's going to be successful. The problem is that if they require this on if they end up requiring this on all uh, firearms, and the way that would end up happening is that if Smith and Wesson is found liable, nobody wants to be potentially on the hook for uh, the plaintiffs here are asking for literal millions of dollars. So nobody wants to be on the hook for millions of dollars because some criminal somewhere has fired a gun. Uh, that nobody is going to buy into that. So you'd see these technologies on everything, which would make all of them kind of useless. Uh, what you'd end up seeing is a, a thriving market for used pre, uh, you know, used guns that predate this decision. I think that uh, there is a lot of potential for this case to go wrong. However, this is too early to start saying that the sky is falling. This is really early on in the process. At this stage, it's only going to go ahead to a trial down the road. So we'll have to see what ultimately happens. I'm going to be watching this case with some interest, but the fact that it gets to go to trial doesn't mean that they're going to find liability here. All it means is that it passed a very easy test to pass, and only one out of three of their claims passed this very easy test to pass. So we'll see, but I'm not, I'm not ready to get panicky yet. I say yet because maybe, maybe down the road, you can never necessarily predict the future, but uh, at this stage, we'll have to wait and see. 
So that's uh, sort of a uh, the quick and dirty summary of this. Uh, let me know in the comments below. Is that sufficient? Do you want to hear more? Um, if if people if there's an appetite for it, I can go through and go through the language of the case, go through the exact claims that are made. There's several arguments here that I've cut out just for time. This is still going to be a bit of a long video, but uh, let me know. Um, otherwise, I'll go on and do something else if that's what people would prefer. This case has the potential to have a huge impact, so I will be following up with it as it develops. It's a civil case, however, so they tend to develop fairly slowly. I'm not sure when there'll be another update, but it will probably be some time. But I will be keeping an eye on this one and share any new developments sort of as we see them. Uh, I just also want to thank you for your support. Uh, I'm creeping up on 30,000 subscribers here, which is a big deal. It was unimaginable when I was starting, so thank you. Uh, please like this video, share it with your friends, uh, subscribe if you haven't yet. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, Sir Daniel Wicks of Alberta, uh, Jason Elliott, Canada's National Firearms Association, North Central Process Service, Kyle Martin, Jean-Guy Toussaint, Canadian Shooting Sports Association, and bcamf.org, which I understand is the British Columbia Airsoft Marksmanship Federation. So thank you. And at the $30 level, Sights and Arms Limited. At the $20 level, Dale Nesbitt, Cameron Johnson, Andrew Elsich, Adam Meester, and Marc Olivier Damour, as well as a number of you at the $10 level who will be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you once again for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge, and see you next time.